Please stand to your feet out of love, respect, and esteem for the public reading of God's word. The title of my message, Power Up, Fueling Your Faith for the Modern World. I will be reading from the Gospel of Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 44, and here is the word of the Lord. This is Jesus speaking, by the way. Then he said to them, these are the words which I've spoken to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this powerful, incredible section of scripture. Thank you that just as Jesus opened the understanding of the disciples to the teachings of scripture. May you, Holy Spirit, today open our understanding to the message that will be preached today. We humbly pray and ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And everyone said, amen. You may be seated. So family, this is the main idea from the sermon today. Are you in pursuit of power? It's possible you possess it already. Now here's the key thought. Last Sunday was Pentecost Sunday, one of the most holy days in the Christian calendar. Initially, uh, Pentecost is a fitable holy day in the New Testament era of grace, signifying the inauguration of the New Testament church through the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit prophesied from the prophet Joel, as described in Acts chapter 2 as the events unfolded. And this momentous event marks the beginning of the church's mission, empowering believers with the presence and power of the Holy Spirit to spread the gospel and fulfill God's purpose on the earth. So Pentecost uh, was a feast in the Old Testament. The the term Pentecost means 50th because there were were several important feasts in the Old Testament that the Jewish people had to practice. One was the Feast of Passover. And then exactly 50 days after the the, the Feast of Passover was the Feast of Harvest or the Feast of Pentecost. It always happened that way. So it's not coincidental, Christ is our Passover. So in the New Testament, after Jesus died, exactly 50 days after Christ died, or excuse me, after he was resurrected, 50 days after he was resurrected was Pentecost. It's not a coincidence, God works on a a divine time calendar, divine timing. So what happened? After Jesus was raised from the dead, for the next 40 days, exactly, exactly, For the next 40 days, he appeared to over 500 witnesses post-resurrection. On day 40, after the resurrection, he is the ascension of Christ. He ascended to heaven as the disciples were eyewitnesses of this incredible moment. Before their very eyes, he was caught up into the heavens, into the clouds, until they could see him no more. Two angels appeared and said, why do you stand here gazing? This same Jesus shall return again. He hasn't, that hasn't happened yet, but it's about to happen. So that was day 40. Christ died, three days, three nights, buried in the tomb. Day three, Sunday, first day of the week, raised from the dead. Next 40 days, pierced over 500 eyewitnesses. And then there's a 10-day period. A 10-day period from day 40 to day 50, because day 50 was what? The 50th, it's Pentecost. For 10 days, Jesus told the disciples, I want you to go to Jerusalem and I want you to wait there. I want you to tarry there for the next two weeks, 10 days, which they did. And on day 50, like clockwork, the Holy Spirit descends, Acts chapter two, verses one through four. And and there was a sound as of of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the entire house where they were seated, 120 of them, by the way. And cloven tongues as a fire rested upon each of them. And verse four says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them utterance. Boom, that's the beginning of the church age, of this dispensation that we are living in. And so the final words of Jesus recorded in 
the gospel of Luke, before, right, after, right before his ascension, were these words that we just read. Now, each of the gospels, they kind of give the last words of Jesus. Not, not the seven last sayings of Christ on the cross. We preached that series leading up to Easter this year. Not the seven letters or the seven final sermons of Christ recorded in the book of Revelation. But in the Gospels, after the resurrection, before the ascension, each of the Gospels record the last words of Jesus. For example, Ma- Matthew, Gospel of Matthew, it's Matthew 28, 20, were the last recorded words of Jesus after the resurrection, before the ascension. Are, and remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. In Mark's Gospel, the final recorded words of Jesus before the ascension are found in Mark 16, 17, and 18, which says, this is Jesus speaking, and these signs will accompany those who believe by using my name, they will cast out demons. We see that in the book of Acts. We see that to this day, that demons can be cast out through the name of Christ. You'll speak in new tongues, which is a gift that believers, all believers today, and hundreds of millions around the world have this gift of being able to pray in a heavenly language, talked about in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 19, talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. This beautiful gift of speaking in tongues, as Jesus mentioned here, so they will cast out demons, speak in new tongues, they will pick up snakes. Now, once again, you take Jesus seriously, but not literally. There was a time he said, if your eye offends, you pluck it out. Hope you don't take that literally, or else we'd all be one-eyed people in here today, right? If your hand offends, you cut it off. Not literally, spiritually, significantly. So we, we take Jesus seriously, but we don't take his words literally all the time. So when Jesus said, you'll handle snakes, did you know that there are denominations in the Appalachia where they, have, they, they handle snakes? in their church service as an act of worship. We are not advocating that. We have never done that, and we will never do that here at Trinity Church, as long as I'm alive, okay? Uh, But hey, they they want to test your faith, and so you handle a snake. If it bites you, you you you're not saved, and you're also dead. You're very dead, right? So that's aberrations of, of, of people misapplying it. But then he said, you'll drink any deadly thing, and it won't harm you. So in the book of Acts, Paul was bitten by a snake, and he shook it off in the fire. You'll drink any deadly thing and it won't harm you. There's not an example of that in the book of Acts. But in my own personal travels, I've been overseas in many, many countries. And I have, I have tested this promise. I have drank what I thought was water that tasted more like poison. And I'm still here today. So I'm thankful that that promise is still for us today. Uh, and then he said, you'll lay hands on the sick and they will recover. That, that's a part of the book of Acts, that's a part of any sick among you, let them call for the elders of the church and anoint them with oil and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And if you commit any sins, they shall be forgiven. That's in James chapter five. So we see all that Jesus is saying here. And these were the last words that Mark recorded. But the last words that John recorded is when Jesus spoke to Peter about the disciple he loved, which was John. And in John 21, 22, Jesus said to Peter, if I want him or John, to remain until I come. What's that to you? You follow me. All right. So those were the last recorded words in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and John. But the last words recorded before the ascension are in Luke's Gospel, are where Jesus said, but tarry in Jerusalem till you be endued with power from on high. This was immediately, this immediately took place before his ascension. And it says in the text that we just read that he lifted up his hands and he blessed them. Oh, I wish that blessing was recorded in Scripture. It's not but I would love to know the words that he spoke over his disciples. He literally placed his hands on each of them and blessed them and spoke a blessing over them. And then he did something else. He opened their understanding and through the law and the prophets and Psalms, he explained how Messiah had to die. It's kind of interesting. I don't know if you caught it, but later on you could reread this section of scripture and Jesus in this section of scripture speaks in third, in third person. It was the, 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 that he said the Christ, which is himself, had to die and suffer. But that, that was himself. He's speaking in third person because he's speaking of the significance and the importance of the act that he had just performed, dying on the cross and being raised from the dead. And he gives him this incredible promise. He says, tarry in Jerusalem until you are clothed with power from on high. I love that phrase. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna think through, talk through that phrase. Power from on high. Let's talk about power. There's three thoughts. The first is the seduction of power. There's this allure, there's, the, there's, the, there's an alluring nature, an alluring nature of power, and it never ceases. It captivates us as humans. Matter of fact, 
in our formative years, we embark on a quest of power. First, it's power over our own bodies, right? To learn how to walk. So my, my grandson, Julian, you know, he's nine months. He's standing on his own, but he's not walking yet. And he's learning the power that he possesses that eventually will allow him to take that first step. This happens at, in infancy. Next, he will be exerting control over others, what we call the terrible twos, right? Where you have this power struggle. Now, we're not confessing that over my grandson. It's going to be terrific twos, not terrible twos. And it's not long before we learn that temper tantrums aren't the best way to achieve durable power and influence with people. However, there are some adults at 40, 50, and 60 are still trying to learn this lesson. And in childhood, right, growing up, we all had these fantasies of, of, a, of having some superpower, right? Like for me, I, I really liked the Hulk, Sinbad the Sailor, and, and Superman. And then even as adults, many times, we select a career path swayed by a desire for power. It's not right or wrong, it's just reality. Becoming wealthy, influential, famous. Once again, not right or wrong, it's just reality. And for the right reasons and the right motives, God gives us power to be used for his honor and glory. But there are things in life that actually give you power that can become seductive. Money is a form of power. Politics woo, is a form of power, corrupting power. Education. If you have a high level of intelligence, you have a certain level of power that you can exert over others. Beauty, if you have this natural beauty about you, that's, that's an ability, an influence, and a power that you possess. Religion, religion is power. Athleticism, if you're an athlete, you have a certain level of power you can exert in life, an influence. Law enforcement, medicine, the military are all forms, career paths that are associated with power. Once again, it's not right or wrong, it's just reality. And yet, in government, in business, in religion, in all institutions, even in home life, we have all witnessed the, a certain measure of the misuse and the abuse of power. And ultimately, God will hold us all accountable for the power or the influence that he has given us and how we have chosen to use that. Now, as our personal power grows, there is, we're talking about the seduction of power. As our personal power grows, there's an adverse spiritual transformation that can ambush us if we're not careful. If we're not careful, we become conceited by that, by that power. Pride enters in. We become overconfident. We isolate ourselves, and then the corruption begins. So Jewish theologian Martin Buber writes about this, and he observes, and I'm quoting, that Power can be handled safely only as long as it remains bound to the goal, to the work, to the calling. But what happens if power, powerful people lose track of that essential connection? They're not grounded in God. They don't, they don't remind themselves that, that they will be held accountable for the power that's been entrusted to them. They begin to think that that power exerts, exert, uh, exists for them, for their personal privilege, their perks, their possessions. And if that should happen, this great Jewish theologian went on to say, such power is evil. It is power withdrawn from responsibility, power which betrays the spirit, power in itself. Now you've probably heard one of the most important famous quotes on power from the British aristocrat Lord Action back in the Victorian era, which he said, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. A century before, on our side of the Atlantic, the former president, James Madison, said something very similar. He said, power lodged as it must be in human hands will ever be liable to abuse. Years earlier, as he wrote the US Constitution, this same insight in inspired Madison and the founding fathers to create a proper system of government here in the United States where there would be checks and balances. That's why we have three branches of, of government or three branches of power, the executive, the legislative, and the judicial, the Supreme Court, Congress, and the executive office, the White House. This is to help balance power because there is seduction in power. Power can be, become very corrupt. But here's the second thought. Power from on high. So the power that Jesus is speaking about is not worldly power that can become 
demonic power or devilish power. Jesus spoke about, before his ascension, power from on high. I love that phrase. Once again, power from on high. Let's say that together. Power from on high. Now imagine who Christ was saying this to and when he was saying it. 2,000 years ago to his disciples just before his ascension. They didn't want him to leave. They wanted him to remain. They wanted him to establish the, the, the kingdom of God right here, right now. Why do we have to wait? They didn't know, but we know in hindsight for the last 2,000 years, why can't you just establish the kingdom of God on the earth right now? But he said, I want you to tarry in Jerusalem until you've been endued with this power from on high. So he was speaking to the most powerless group of people living in the world at that time, Jews. They were living in bondage to Rome. Rome was the greatest power the world had ever seen up to that time. The mighty Roman Empire. They understood power. They had power. We, Jews, now we're not just Jews. We're Christians. We're followers of you. We're going to be persecuted and ostracized and kicked out of the temple because of our, our allegiance to you, to that group of people. Jesus said, Terry and Jerusalem, until you be endued with power from on high. You know, in all of our services this weekend, I know there are men and women in our services at times in our life, maybe right now you feel utterly powerless. Maybe you're battling addiction. Maybe you're battling a financial crisis. Maybe, God forbid, you're in a relationship crisis. Maybe you're walking through betrayal of a friend or, or a spouse or a child, God forbid. And at times in our life, we feel utterly powerless, like who am I and what am I? And sometimes it seems as though the problems that you are struggling with are beyond your ability, and they are. But they're not beyond God's ability. And he says, tarry and wait, for there is a power from on high that can be yours. And God's power is greater than any power that may be coming against your life right now. Now, in the, in the New Testament, okay, the New Testament was, was written from the original language Greek. The original New Testament was in Koine Greek, the known language of that day. So when it was translated, you know, in Latin, ultimately into English, sometimes it takes like three or four or five English words to, to express one Greek word. So when it comes to the word power or strength that's listed in the New Testament, there are three to four different Greek words that are used in the New Testament for the word power or strength. So the word power that when Jesus said, you shall receive power from on high, the Greek word that's used here in the Bible is the Greek word dunamis. You've heard this before if you've ever, if you've ever heard a message on this, dunamis. Now, the Greek word dunamis is where we get our English word dynamite. So we're familiar with, you know, the Norwegian inventor, Alfred Nobel, who discovered dynamite. We know how powerful dynamite is. The, there's two kinds of power in the world. There's, there's power that can destroy human power, and then there's creative divine power from God that can heal and restore. So just as dynamite has the power to change landscapes, so this power, dunamis, is the word that Jesus used. This dynamo, this dynamic power comes from above. It comes through the person of the Holy Spirit. So there's the seduction of power, there's power from on high, and then there's power from below. Now, we're all familiar with power that is worldly, power that is earthly, that is absolutely terrifying. Dr. Robert Oppenheimer, the father of the atomic bomb, worked on the Manhattan Project. We're all familiar with it now, especially since the movie came out, was it, what, last year? The scientific breakthrough that was unleashed and discovered through atomic power is absolutely terrifying. To think right now that there are weapons that are in the hands of Putin in Russia and he's threatening to use them against Britain and America if NATO continues to interfere in his war against the Ukraine. This is a very serious threat. He has them. That crazy guy in North Korea, Kim Jong-un, he has them, threatening to use them all the time. China has them. They are right now sending warships. They have warships around Taiwan. Our military right now is preparing for war against China in defense of Taiwan. The point is, we live in a very dangerous world with real bombs that can annihilate and wipe out entire civilizations. 
entire cities. But here's what we know. God's power is far greater than any power man has ever, ever discovered. And God's power will always, always disempower what the enemy and the world may be attempting to do that would interfere with his divine plan and his divine design. But this is the power that's promised on Pentecost. This is the power that came through the work and the person and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Imagine Jesus, the death of Christ. He dies on the cross. They take down at 3 p.m. He died, he was on the cross from nine in the morning till three in the afternoon. They had to bury him before sundown, before six o'clock, because that was, the, for the Jewish calendar, that was, the, that was the, the ending of a day and the starting of a new day. That's why three days and three nights, really, it was, he, he died on Friday, was raised on Sunday. It was actually three days according to Hebrew calendar. So at three in the afternoon on Good Friday, they take his body down, his cold, dead corpse, lifeless body, and they place it in a tomb. It's there until... Resurrection Sunday. On Resurrection Sunday, Jesus, who had been in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights, his spirit and soul came back into that dead body. And all of a sudden, by the work and the power of the Holy Spirit, life began to pulsate into every vein in that dead body, into every sinew, into every cell. And on that third day, even though a dead body, a dead cold corpse was carried into that tomb on Resurrection Sunday, Jesus was raised from the dead and he walked out in bodily form. Hallelujah. Oh, what, what a miracle. And the Bible says in Romans chapter eight, verse 11, let's read this verse out loud together. The spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same spirit living within you. You, not a different spirit, not a lesser spirit, but the exact same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead on Resurrection Sunday lives inside of you. Woo, come on, buddy. That spirit of life lives in you. Now listen, some of you are gonna hear this for the very first time. Because if you were raised Catholic or Protestant, if you were raised Baptist, Methodist, Episcopalian, Church of Christ, you've never, probably you've never heard this before. But there is a secondary work of, of God in the life of a Christian. What do I mean by that? You get saved, the Holy Spirit comes in you, but then there's what's called, that is exciting, <laughs> there, there, then there's what's called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Did you know that when Jesus told the disciples, go to Jerusalem and wait there until the Holy Spirit comes, they were already Christians. They had already witnessed the resurrected Christ. They had already professed faith in Christ. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So when you get saved, matter of fact, the 120 believers that were in the upper room on the day of Pentecost that had been waiting for two weeks or 10 days for the promise that was spoken of in Joel, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, they were all Christians. If they had died before Pentecost, before the Holy Spirit came, they would have all went to heaven, all of them. And yet, even though they were Christians and they were saved, and when you get saved, you can't get saved without the Holy Spirit. Jesus even said, no man comes to the Father except the Spirit draw him. And there's no way you can be born again without the power and the work of the Holy Spirit. So when you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes in you and is living inside of you. Listen, in the kingdom of heaven... There are no second-class citizens. In the kingdom of heaven, there are no second-class Christians. In the kingdom of heaven, God has no grandsons. God has no granddaughters. He only has sons and daughters, and all of us have VIP status. Yeah? But sometimes there is a distinction. It's not to make you feel ashamed or guilty or inferior, but there are those that have experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit and those that haven't. And, and I don't fault you if you haven't. You know why? Because if you were raised Catholic or Baptist or uh, many of these other denominations, many times you're not taught about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I don't, I don't know why. I guess there must be a level of 
maybe ignorance, the level maybe, I would hope not deception. But in the Bible, it's very clear. I, I've had debates with, with uh, fellow believers in a loving way because they don't believe in the secondary work of the Holy Spirit or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And it's in the book of Acts. It's in Acts chapter two. It's in Acts chapter eight. It's in Acts chapter 10 at Cornelius' house, the first Gentile to be saved, filled the Holy Spirit. While Peter preached, they were saved. While Peter preached, the Holy Spirit fell upon each of them and they all began to speak in other tongues and magnify God. That's Acts chapter 10, verses 44, 45, and 46. So in Acts 2, in Acts 8, Philip the evangelist goes to preach in Samaria. They, they all get saved, delivered from demons. But then a couple of days later, John, uh, John and uh, Peter and John show up a couple days later, after this revival, it says this in Acts 8, because they had not yet received the Holy Spirit. They'd only been, they'd only been baptized in, in Christ. So Peter and John show up and prays for them to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then in Acts 10, Cornelius, I shared that example. Acts 19, this is 20 years after Pentecost. The 19th chapter of Acts is 20 years after the day of Pentecost. Paul is passing through the upper regions of Ephesus, Acts Chapter 19, verses 1 3. He meets certain disciples and he said, This, have you received the Holy Spirit since you became a Christian, since you believed? And here's what they said We have not even heard of the Holy Spirit. He said, Well, what baptism were you baptized in? They said, John's baptism. He said, Guys, you, you know, John baptized for repentance in water. Christ, you need to be baptized into Jesus. So they get saved, and it says this read it for yourself. I'm not making it up. Test me, prove it for yourself. It says this in verse 8. Of Acts chapter 19, Paul laid his hands on these disciples. The Holy Spirit came upon them and they all began to speak in other tongues and prophesy. What did Jesus say way back in Mark chapter 16? These signs will follow them that believe. Friends, I've been all over the world. I have seen people pray in, in the Holy Spirit all over the world. It's one of the most beautiful gifts. So many of you know my testimony. So I got saved, not in a, not in a church, not at a Christian concert, not at a Billy Graham crusade. I wish I would have, but I didn't. I got saved because my sister became a Christian. She began to witness to me. I was living in a three-bedroom apartment in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And uh, I was supposed to be living there with my dad. I was in ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, living with my dad. He was never there because he was at his girlfriend's house. So I had this apartment all to myself. And my dad's bar, this restaurant bar my dad owned, was in walking distance. It was literally a three-minute walk from my apartment, 9800 Montgomery uh, the block of 9800 Montgomery and Eubank in Albuquerque, New Mexico. The, the strip mall is still there. And uh, I had access, I had the key, I had the code, I had access to gallons of margarita and free beer. I had more friends then in my life than I've ever had. <laughs> I was a sinner, I was a, I was a hellion. It's amazing how much sin I was able to pack in my life to the age of 17. And my sister witnesses to me, gives me a Bible, I start reading it, and, and my eyes are open, right? And, and I, I give my life to Christ. But then she says this, like two weeks later, she comes back and she says, but Carl, now you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I go, what? You need to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. I said, well, show me in the Bible, because I didn't trust anybody unless she showed me in the Bible. She showed me and she took me to all these scriptures. And she said, Carl, this is a gift that God wants to bless you with. I said, okay, how do we do this? She goes, well, get on your knees. You don't have to, but I got on my knees. She laid her hands on me. She began to pray for me. She says, now Carl, just raise your hands towards heaven. Just begin to praise God. And then you're gonna, something's gonna come, not out of here to here, but out of here to here, because Jesus said, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And she said, honey, because she's my older sister, she said, honey, you're gonna begin to pray in a language that you've never known before. It's a heavenly language. And I'm like, okay, I saw it. You showed it to me. Let's do this. So she starts praying, I start praising. Next thing I know, a heavenly language, ooh, glory to God, begins to roll out of me through my mouth, praising and magnifying God. I have been praying in the Holy Spirit since, since that moment to this day, every day of my life. You're like, well, that's awesome, Carl, but I don't have it, that's okay. Once again, there are no second class citizens in the house of God or in the family of God. But I want to whet your appetite. I want to encourage you. I want you to tarry. I want you to ask. I want you to pursue the deeper revelation of God in your life. I want you to, we have booklets, right, at, at Guest Connections on the infilling of the Holy Spirit, why tongues. And I want you to go to the Bible, Acts 2. You can get this sermon, read it. Acts 2, Acts 8, Acts 10, Acts 19, 1 Corinthians 14, Mark 16. There are over... 
30 references to this one gift, praying in the Holy Spirit mentioned in the Bible. It's a wonderful gift. And Jesus said, I want you to tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. I don't know why it works this way, but sometimes Christians tarry several years, some several weeks, some several hours. Some pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit and then they don't receive their prayer language right away. That's okay. Once again, no condemnation, no judgment. Just continue to seek the Lord. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Stay in the word. Begin to continue to seek what God has for you so that you could live under the full blessing of God. I had a guy walk up to me Saturday at the end of last night's service. He said, you know, Carl, it took, it took me two, I tarried for two years, but now I, I'm, I'm experiencing the fullness of the spirit in my life and it's never been so, so good. So whether it takes two minutes, two days, two weeks, two months, two years, I don't know. I'm just simply saying there's so much more that God has for all of us and it's a promise. Tarry until you be endued with power dunamis, explosive power, not worldly power, not seductive power, not human power, but power which is from on high, power which is above. Come on, let's thank God one more time. Can we do that? Let me pray for you. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father, I pray for men and women today that feel utterly powerless. They feel so weak in what they're facing in their life. But Lord, I thank you for the promise of scripture. When I'm weak, when I'm weak, then you're strong. So Lord, we admit today, I admit today, I am powerless, but you are all powerful. And I pray your power to be at work in the lives of everyone in service today who right now may feel powerless, but may they come to this realization. Greater is he that lives in them than he that lives in the world. And the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells within them today. Now, with heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you've never been born again, or you're a Christian and you're backslidden and you would like to rededicate your life to Christ, I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. Friend, if you'll say it with your own mouth and mean it from your own heart, Christ will come into your life and change your life from the inside out. Here we go. Dear God in heaven, I know I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. There's only one Savior. His name is Jesus. I call upon you, Jesus. I ask you now, Come into my heart, come into my life, be my Lord, and be my Savior. I turn from sin to the true and living God. I receive his love, his grace, and his forgiveness. Dear God in heaven, you're now my father, and I am your child. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit and give me strength to live for you, serve you all the days of my life beginning today for the rest of eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we thank the Lord together, church family?